Hello, and welcome to this video for Physics 132, which describes where light comes from and talks a little bit about interpreting light as a wave. So let's begin with the basics. Where does light come from? Light is generated any time a charge undergoes acceleration. This is a connection to an idea from Physics 131. Just like in Physics 131, it's not the motion of the charge that matters, but it's acceleration. So moving charges don't generate light, only accelerating ones do. To expand upon this connection to 131 a little bit more, if a charge accelerates by slowing down, I hate the word deceleration, slowing down is still acceleration, then from Newton's second law, F equals ma, we know that a force has acted upon it. Assuming that it takes some distance for this slowing down to occur, then the force must have been applied for some distance, and we know that work was therefore done on the charged particle. By the statement of conservation of energy, or equivalently, the first law of thermodynamics, if work is done on a particle, then the particle's energy must change. That energy must go somewhere, and where does it often go? It goes into light. So here's an example with which you might be familiar from your chemistry class. An electron in an outer energy level of an atom falls to a lower energy level. There's this change in energy as the electron falls. That energy has to go somewhere. It goes into the release of light. Electrons changing energy levels, however, is not the only way to produce light. Think about one of those old school incandescent lamps with the filament in it that get hot as you turn them on. To understand why these incandescent lamps give off light, we have to understand a little bit about what is temperature. So recall from Physics 131 that temperature is related to the average kinetic energies of particles moving around randomly on the atomic and subatomic scales. So as these particles are bouncing around randomly, they're changing directions. From 131, we know that acceleration is a vector. So if velocity changes direction, then we know that there is acceleration. So once again, even any object with temperature will emit light due to the accelerating charges bouncing around on the atomic and subatomic scale. So in summary, every object with a temperature, i.e. everything, will emit some amount of light of some type. Our eyes, however, are only sensitive to certain kinds of light, and we therefore cannot see this light from everyday objects such as you and I. We don't see light coming off of us because our eyes are not sensitive to the kind of light that we emit due to our temperature. However, we can build devices that can see the light given off by more everyday objects such as people by using technologies such as infrared cameras. So that's where light comes from, accelerating charges. Now let's move into the second part of this video where we explore light's identity as a wave. So what are some properties of light waves? Like all waves, light waves are characterized by a wavelength, a frequency, a speed, which follows the usual uh, relationship of V equals lambda F, and an amplitude. However, there are some important unique characteristics of light waves. For light, the wave in the vacuum speed is always the same. It's always the speed of light, 299792, 458 meters per second which we in this class will always approximate to 3 times 8, 10 to the 8th meters per second. Close enough. So in a vacuum, V equals lambda F turns into C equals lambda F because all light waves, regardless of their wavelength or frequency or amplitude, travel at this same fundamental speed. For the amplitude of the light wave, we will not use the symbol A. We will instead use the symbol E and the amplitude of a light wave has the units of newtons per coulomb. So newtons are the unit of force, and coulomb, as you've already discussed elsewhere in your prep, is the unit of a charge. 
So the amplitude of a light wave is a newton per coulomb. We will see why this is the unit of a light wave's amplitude later in this particular course. But for right now, you just need to know that those are the units. Now, we will, as I've said, use the symbol E for the amplitude of the light wave. This is not the energy of the wave. It is related to the energy of the wave, but it is not the energy of the wave. So yes, it seems unnecessarily confusing. Normally E is energy, but now we're using capital E for something else. Why can't we use just a different letter for the amplitude of a light wave? Again, this choice will make some sense later in the course, but for now, you just kind of have to accept it. We only have 26 Latin letters and 26 Greek letters to work with, and some of these, like O and Omicron, look the same. So by necessity, every letter takes on multiple meanings in physics, and you have to know which meaning you're using based upon the context. So in this regard, math is just like any other language. For example, the word buffalo in English has three different meanings. A town in New York, a large uh, mammal native to the prairies of North America, and to bully. And you have to know which definition is appropriate based upon the context. So the symbol E falls into a similar category. Sometimes it's energy, sometimes it's amplitude of the light wave. You have to know based upon the context which is being used. You have to know, based upon the context, which meaning is being used. So like I've said, there are many different kinds of light. Where do these different kinds of light come from? Well, different wavelengths or frequencies represent different kinds of light. So you'll explore more of the different kinds of light in a latter part of this prep where you talk about photons, or light as particles, but here's a basic rundown. At very large wavelengths of even more than a meter, we have what you might call radio waves. And these include the radio waves that you hear on your radio in your car. Then we have our microwaves, which have wavelengths which are in the sort of centimeter range. These are things used, for example, by microwave ovens, uh, your wireless router, that sort of thing. Then we get into the infrared, which is given off by all objects with heat. So this is where like your, your heat-based night vision goggles come in. Then we have this very small window of the visible light, where in this range, different wavelengths correspond to different colors. Red is about 700 nanometers, purple is about 440 different nanometers. So this is the small, tiny kind of light that you can see. After the visible light, we have the ultraviolet, which is what gives you sunburns. Then the x-rays, which are what's used, for example, in medical x-rays. And then finally, at the very, very smallest wavelengths of picometers, 10 to the minus 12 meters, we have the gamma rays, which are things, for example, used in pet imaging. So these are the different kinds of light and a brief overview of their different types in terms of wavelength. You're also given in this picture the fre corresponding frequencies, which you can get by C equals lambda F. Also represented are the temperatures of objects which emit light in this particular region. So objects that are 100 Kelvin emit in this terahertz range. Objects that are 10,000 Kelvin emit in this visible range, those types of things. So here's a brief rundown of the different types of light. Note, you will be expected to memorize the order of the large divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum. For example, from longest wavelength to shortest, we have radio, microwave, infrared, visible, UV, X-ray, gamma ray. 
You do not need to memorize the associated wavelengths or frequencies or temperatures or any of that stuff, just the order. Y'all know that I'm not a big proponent of encouraging memorization. However, as science majors, I feel that you should know this basic order of the different parts of light. A document with all of these details of the different kinds of light to help you with your memorization is included in your reading. One thing I should point out is that light is also sometimes called electromagnetic radiation. And so the kinds of light are called the EM spectrum. So you'll see this terminology used. Electromagnetic spectrum or EM spectrum just means the kinds of light. But this is giving you a bit of a hint on where this whole course is going and how light, electricity, and magnetism are all going to be deeply connected in some fundamental way, which we'll come to by the end of this course. So we've now seen that the frequency or wavelength of a light wave tells us what kind of light are we going to have, radio waves, infrared, UV, that sort of thing. What does the amplitude of the light wave correspond to? The amplitude, remember we're using capital E for the amplitude, is related to the intensity of the light, as in the watts per square meter, by this expression. The intensity is one half C epsilon naught E squared, where C is the usual speed of light, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, and epsilon naught is a property of just empty space. You might not think of empty space as having properties, but it does. So epsilon naught is a property of empty space called the permittivity of free space. And it has this value, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 joule, uh, coulomb squared over joule meters. We will talk more about this number throughout this course. You, of course, do not need to memorize this value. It's on your sheet with your equations and your constants. But for now, you just need to know it's a property of empty space. We'll talk more exactly what property of empty space it corresponds to later when we get to electrostatics.